Well, you know, a couple of days ago I was in my car and I was listening to National Public Radio, and I heard a uh, segment on the health care battles that go on perennially in Congress, and the woman who was delivering the commentary mentioned that Senator Kennedy, that's uh, Senator Teddy Kennedy, has worked throughout his career for expanded health care coverage. And I thought to myself, no, no, ma'am, you don't have that correct. He has not worked throughout his career for expanded health care coverage. He has worked for expanded government health care coverage. And it's very, very important that you be specific about that because there are lots of people in this country who are working for expanded health care coverage. They're called doctors and insurance companies and pharmaceutical companies and pharmacists, and all kinds of people are working to try to expand health care coverage and help more and more people. It is only people like Senator Kennedy who's trying to expand the government in the process. And just adding the word government to the statement that he's trying to expand health care coverage immediately puts it in a different light. And people who would just sort of automatically say, yes, that's a good thing, would suddenly realize that what this man is trying to do is to expand the government's reach into our lives. A moment or two later, the same woman who was discussing this and presenting her coverage of this particular matter made a statement, and I'm giving you all this from memory, but I'm pretty sure I'm not distorting what I heard. She said, Senator Kennedy has proposed a plan by which all employers will be required to provide a certain level of health care coverage. Now, she said he had proposed a plan by which all employers will be required to provide a certain level of health care coverage. Can you imagine how much difference it would make and how much more accurate it would have been if she had said, Senator Kennedy has proposed a plan by which all employers will be forced to provide a certain level of health care coverage? Because that's exactly what we're talking about. Required has a certain connotation of, well, you know, this is something you ought to do. Forced makes it plain that what we're talking here about are fines and imprisonment if you do not obey and you do not do what Senator Kennedy wants you to do. But there's more to it that she should have said in describing what Senator Kennedy is trying to do. And of course, I'm not trying to pick on Senator Kennedy here. Uh, he's just the person who happened to be the example. You could take a Republican senator, a, a President Bush, anybody else, and you still have the same kind of problem of the words that are used by the press to describe what it is these people are proposing. But what this woman should have said about Senator Kennedy's plan is Senator Kennedy has proposed a plan by which all employers will be forced to provide a certain level of health care coverage regardless of what the employers and employees might prefer to have. And that's exactly what's involved in any government program. The reason I bring this up is not to rail against government health care coverage. You know how I feel about that. And you may very well feel the same way. But rather because of the way the press reports these things. The press has always given us a very, very, very imprecise, vague, blurred picture of government action so that people do not realize exactly what is at stake in a government program. When Senator Kennedy gets his way, it means that the money that an employer has, has available to provide for his pool of labor in wages and benefits will not be used solely in the way that would be the most efficient for the company, that would be able to provide the best service to the employees so that they will want to stay there and work hard for the company, but rather will have to be what Senator Kennedy would like to have rather than what the employees or the employer would like to have. The employees might prefer not to have expanded health care coverage but instead have longer vacations or just simply a raise in wages or maybe a better parking lot, or maybe better cafeteria. They might want a lot of things in preference to better health care coverage. You cannot say you must have better health care coverage because everybody knows that's more important than a better cafeteria or a longer vacation or anything else, because how much health care coverage is enough? Should we keep adding to it, keep forcing employers to provide more and more until every employee has his own personal nurse? No, of course not. It has to stop someplace, and where should it stop? Obviously, at the point the employer and the employees are satisfied with the program, not when Senator Kennedy is satisfied. And this really just calls attention, this incident that I heard on the radio a couple of days ago, it just calls attention to a very, very long-standing problem. The press has always been the government's ally in proposing new government programs. The press has always acted on the assumption that government and employees are on the same side of the fence and the employer is on the other side of the fence. The press has always acted on the assumption that the government and buyers are on the same side of the fence and sellers are on the other side of the fence. And you could perhaps create a table that shows two sides warring against each other. On one side, what you have are the greedy employers, manufacturers, and sellers. And on the other side, you have the employees, the buyers, the government, and the press who are trying to protect the buyers and the employees. But it's a false picture. I'll give you a good example of the family leave bill that the Democrats were so proud of passing in the early years of the Clinton administration. Every company must provide family leave, and that means that anybody who has a problem in the family, a sickness or whatever, can get up to 30 days of unpaid family leave. Well, isn't that wonderful? What about the employee who doesn't have a family but 
The employer still has to allow for this. He still has to, even though he doesn't have to pay wages to the employee who gets his unpaid family leave, he still has to hire somebody to take his place. He still has to train the person to take that person's place. It is a costly uh, endeavor for the employer. And as a result of that, it means that the money that the employer has available to provide to his employees in the form of wages and benefits is going to be diminished by whatever it takes to implement the family leave program. Once again, it means that the employees who might have preferred to have longer vacations, might have preferred to have higher wages, might have preferred to have a better health care plan, might have preferred to have anything, a better softball team, whatever it is the employees want will be overruled by what the politicians have decreed and forced the employer to do. And when the press reports this as a victory for employees, they are doing a disservice not just to the employees, but a disservice to the truth, because it is not a victory for the employees. It is a defeat for the employees. If the employees really wanted family leave, any progressive, intelligent employer who is trying to keep the best employees available so that they won't go running off to his competitor will provide family leave instead of a softball team or whatever else the alternatives might have been. They don't need a government agent to come in with a gun in his hand and say, this is what you're going to do or else. They will do what their employees want up to a reasonable limit simply in order to keep the best employees there. Anybody who knows anything about business understands this. But, of course, the politicians in Washington know very little about business and care a little about business. So, really, the way it should be lined up is that on one side are the employers and employees who have mutual interests the buyers and the sellers who have mutual interest in wanting to be free to be able to get together and make mutually profitable exchanges, but the employers, employees, buyers, manufacturers, and sellers are all on one side of the fence, and on the other side are the government and the press who are continually working against them. I mean, you have the same thing with uh, things like the press saying cable uh, subscribers won a victory today when the government passed a bill requiring all cable companies to do X, Y, and Z. All right, so now the cable companies won't be able to do what their customers might have wanted because they'll have to do what the politicians wanted. Continuing with this question about the press, a couple more points I'd like to make. Uh, number one, uh, just a personal indulgence. I have always wished that just one day, just for one day, I could sit in a newsroom at, well, at a television news network, CNN, or for the ABC Evening News or something else, and just go through and edit some of the news reports that the, the reporter is going to read and just make them a little bit more accurate. Instead of saying workers won a victory today when Congress raised the minimum wage to $6 an hour, let's just rewrite it and say workers were dealt a blow today when Congress decreed that no one who is not yet worth $6 an hour can be employed in the United States. And when they pass a bill with some kind of mandate on business, just include the word force in there. As I mentioned before, Congress passed a bill today forcing employers under threat of fines and imprisonment to do such and such. Maybe terrorists retaliated today for years of American foreign policy interference in the Middle East by such and such, whatever it may be, and just call a spade a spade, what it is. This brings up the question of, is the press biased? And we hear about this all the time. Of course, uh, conservatives have been complaining for years and years and years about the liberal bias in the press and pointing to polls showing that most reporters are Democrats and so on. But meanwhile, Democrats complain that most of the media are owned by these big corporations, so obviously they're Republican-controlled. And I think it misses the whole point. I think that in the news reports, the editors and reporters try to be somewhat objective and somewhat neutral, but because they don't understand a great deal of what they're writing about, they misinterpret what has happened. They misinterpret something as a victory for workers when it's a defeat for workers. They interpret something as a victory for buyers when it's actually a defeat for buyers. And I think that if there is any bias whatsoever, it is not a bias so much towards Republicans or Democrats or conservatives or liberals as it is a bias towards big government. Obviously, the reporters and journalists have generally always looked kindly towards big government, even if they don't look kindly towards various individual politicians. But it should have been obvious to conservatives over this past year that the press can be just as friendly and biased towards Republican big government as it can towards Democratic big government. And, of course, the best example of that is the fact that on news broadcasts, we saw the government slogan, Operation Iraqi Freedom, plastered across the screen any time that a uh, report was coming through about the war in Iraq. In other words, this is where how the government defined the battle in Iraq as being a fight for Iraqi freedom, and the president just dutifully reported it in the same way that they will dutifully report that Senator Kennedy is trying to do something to improve our health care, when in fact he's doing just the opposite. They don't use that Operation Iraqi Freedom much anymore on the television screens, obviously, because it's like ashes in the mouth. It, it just doesn't play very well, not even in Peoria. But there is a certain bias there towards government. Uh, but this reflects a certain bias that exists throughout the culture. I mean, we grow up 
going to government schools. And in those government schools, we're taught that it was government that saved the country from the Great Depression. It was government that saved the world in World War II. It is government that has done everything that has made the, the country better. It is government that got rid of child labor. It is government that makes our cars safe. It is government that protects us from bad food and uh, bad medicines and uh, all of these things. So why shouldn't the press be biased towards big government? Our teachers are. So many of our writers are. Our entertainers are. Our movies are biased in that direction. I mean, whenever you see a movie, for instance, uh, where there's some kind of a battle between environmentalists and land developers, who do you think is going to turn out to be the good guy and who's going to turn out to be the crook? Obviously, the environmentalist will be the, the courageous martyr, while the land developer is going to be some kind of a shady crook. You know that. And in uh, Matlock or some other mystery, the guy that's going to be killed is going to be the, the businessman because he's going to have the most enemies and therefore the most possible suspects to make a good drama because we just assume that a businessman must be a crook or he couldn't have gotten very, very rich. This is the culture that's been created, so we shouldn't be too hard on the reporters and the journalists. This is what they know, just like so many people know. And yet, of course, government is not our friend. Government is not our beneficiary. You would have to look long and hard to try to come up with anything that government has done that has on net balance improved America. All that we enjoy, the telephones, the cars, the airplanes, the good food, all of these things have come from the private sector, not from government. Before we go to the phones, just to finish up, I said I would love to be able to, just for one day, rewrite the copy that comes through the newsroom. But, you know, to a certain extent, you can do that. When you're listening to a talk radio show and you hear the news on the hour and you hear one of these situations where they use the word require or propose that or whatever it is instead of just simply saying force and simply calling a spade a spade and you can spot it just make a quick note of it and then call into the show and call attention to it and say you know you may want to tell your newsmen there that, that uh, this is not some benevolent suggestion that the government's making they're talking about sticking a gun in employers back and backs and uh, forcing them to go along with this regardless of what might be good for the employees or the employer so uh, you can be your own editor and rewrite and you know Maybe it may make a little difference. We'll see. Well, let's find out what's going on out in the real world. Let's talk first with Sonia in Florida. Good evening, Sonia. Hi, Harry. Hello there. I read your book, um, Why Government Doesn't Work. Oh. <laughs> I'm 20 years old, so I'm kind of new to this whole <laughs> did you say? Did you say 20 years old? Yeah. Oh. Well, welcome to our world. I, <laughs> I hope you can make your way in it. Yeah, I feel like a whole illusion of what the world is like and how government operates has just, just been broken for me in the past two months and... I'm just elated to hear you on the air and hear what you have to say. What did they teach you in school, in general? <laughs> well, basically they just taught me that America is a free country, and just the more I've researched it and the more I've learned about how many laws there are and how it dictates everyone's life, I've realized that I don't know if that's true anymore. Sure. Well, of course, the word freedom is a relative term because we don't have absolute freedom in the world under any circumstances. But the word liberty, I guess, is more precise because we think of liberty as being defined in relationship to government. And even though we may not even there ever have absolute liberty in the sense of having no government control over us whatsoever, we still always are in a situation that's relative. And so the question always is, at what point have you crossed the line where you would say, I'm not really free after all. Obviously, we're freer than the people are in Russia today right. or in Syria or Saudi Arabia and so on, but we're not nearly as free as the people in the United States were just 50 years ago, let alone 100 years ago. And uh, that's what, of course, is most important to us as Americans is to try to restore the kind of freedom that gave us the prosperity that we have today that we're sort of coasting off of. Right, because you grow up just, I mean, I feel like I've grown up just believing that this is the way things are and I don't know, just maybe that this isn't the way that things should be, though, at the same time. You know what I mean? Yes, absolutely. In fact, I always think that a key phrase is that it doesn't have to be this way, that this isn't the only way it could be. It's been a different way before, and it worked. And the only way that you can say that it didn't work was that it didn't last, that the politicians were able to take it away from us. But we know it doesn't have to be this way. We don't have to see almost half of our incomes being confiscated by state, federal, and local governments. Uh, we don't have to have business tied up in so much red tape that they can't spend their time pleasing their customers. And we don't have to be in a situation where we're afraid of the rest of the world and the rest of the world is afraid of us. And so it's up to people like you and me to try to let people know that there are better ways of doing it. And I'm the same as everybody else. I fall into the habit of focusing on the negative and all the laws and all the terrible things that have been taken away from us when that's important that people recognize that but we also need to spend part of our time talking about all the benefits that would flow if we got rid of a lot of these laws what it would mean to you as a person how much more money you'd have to spend how much more control you'd have how much more capable you'd be of raising your children by your values and uh, these things because these can be very very inspiring so we have to have to remember to talk about the positive side of this because it's really two sides of one coin uh, of the same coin liberties on one side and the 
blessings and the benefits that flow from it, and on the other side is government and the dangers and the problems that flow from putting our faith in government. Right. I have a one-year-old son, so I guess what's making me think about all this is picturing 20 years from now, thinking about what our country is going to be like when he is my age. Well, I wish you the very best. I hope that you can find a way to insulate yourself from it as much as possible and do what you can without uh, bending your life completely out of shape. Do what you, can, what you can to help other people realize that it doesn't have to be this way. And I, I remain hopeful, not terribly optimistic, but I remain hopeful because I, I can see how we can turn this around. But the odds may be against us, but it is still possible. So I hope that you will remain at least hopeful, if not optimistic, <laughs> if, you get, if you get my drift about the difference. Yes. Yeah. Are you running for president again? No. <laughs> no. No, I had my uh, my medical examination a few weeks ago, and the doctors gave me a complete clearance. They said all my delusions are gone, <laughs> and I can lead a normal life now. Well, thank you. <laughs> well, thank you, Sonia. I'm glad you called and uh, check in with us from time to time. Okay, well, Good. Bye. Well, you know, I, uh, one thing I might like to hear from you uh, folks uh, about tonight is just how hopeful or optimistic are you? And if you have any hope whatsoever and any optimism, what is the basis of that? What is it you think can be done, or what is it you think ought to be done? to try to turn this around so that we can see a better life for our children than we've been seeing over the last few decades here in America. Well, let's see what Chuck in California has to say about it. Good evening, Chuck. Well, I'll answer your question first because I was going to say the answer to your question at the end of my comments, and that is, I'm like you, I don't have a lot of optimism, but I, if there is any hope, it is in a program of, of education of the unenlightened and to vote strictly libertarian. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, I wrote an article this past week in which I said, that the one thing you don't want to do is to vote Republican or Democratic because that tells them that they don't have to do anything to change. You're, they're doing just fine, and you'll vote for them regardless. And I said that I think that the only options are either to vote Libertarian or don't vote at all. And maybe the odds against that actually making a difference over time might be 20 to 1 against it. But the odds against making a change by voting Republican or Democrat have to be trillions to one against. Well, you answered my question before I got a chance to ask. I was, going to ask. <laughs> I was going to ask if there was any circumstance that a libertarian should vote for any other candidate besides the libertarian that's on his ballot. Well, I would have to say, I, I haven't really given a lot of thought to this, so this is off the top of my head, but I'd have to say that it would have to be a Republican or Democrat who not only was talking like a libertarian, but was already in office and had proven that he can act like a libertarian. Because I've often said that Republicans campaign like libertarians and then govern like Democrats. Uh, because very often during the campaigns, they will talk about smaller government. My God, I mean, when George Bush was running for president, he was talking about there are things that government shouldn't do, and there must be limits on government, and we must have a humble foreign policy and all of that. And, uh, and of course, most people who really follow this sort of thing didn't really believe him. But the point was that it isn't enough that somebody talks the game. They've got to prove to you. And if it's a Republican or Democrat, the burden of proof is on them. With a libertarian, I feel that they should get the benefit of the doubt. Now, of course, if a libertarian gets elected he's, these days, it's not going to be to the U.S. Senate or Congress, but if it's to your city council or, or uh, maybe even a state representative, and it turns out that he governs like a Republican or a Democrat, well, then he no longer deserves your, the benefit of the doubt, even if he says, well, I've seen the error of my ways. But the point is that uh, I just can't imagine myself these days voting for a Republican or Democrat. I say these days as though this is a late development. The last time I voted for a Republican or Democrat was in 1960. Oh. Well, you know what happened out here in California. Some of the powerful spokesmen for the Libertarian Party suggested that we vote for Arnold or suggested that we vote for McClintock. Yes. And the Libertarian candidate got the lowest percentage of, I think, anybody, any Libertarian that ever run. And I think, I think we should... We should stop that sort of thing. Oh, yeah. I, I have to say that I thought that was a terrible mistake. It was basically, basically libertarians for McClintock, and it was the conservative Republicans who were trying to marshal the support for Schwarzenegger. And one of their arguments was that if Schwarzenegger got elected, then uh, McClintock would probably be his fiscal advisor. And, of course, since Schwarzenegger's been elected, I haven't heard McClintock's name mentioned once, so he's probably hiding in Schwarzenegger's basement somewhere. Well, my mantra is educate the unenlightened and vote straight libertarian. I think that's a very good idea. And if for any reason you are in a state like Tennessee, where I live, where they don't even allow you to put the word libertarian on the ballot, even though libertarians can run, but they have to have the designation independent, there's, there's not really a lot of, of sense in voting at all. Uh, I think that it's important to realize that one of the things we have to do over time is to build name recognition for the libertarian label, that the word libertarian means much, much smaller government, that the word libertarian means you're having the freedom to make your own decisions, to run your own life, to keep all the money that you earn, and to be a free individual, so that over time people will begin to think of this as a label, that, oh, I see the word libertarian on the ballot, I don't know who any of these people are, but there's one that's got the libertarian label, I'll vote for him. And I think that's what we 
have to feel is the most important objective in running candidates for office at this stage of the game. It's, and that's why the candidates themselves should not become imbued with the idea that, oh, I've got a reason I could win this race. I, there's some special circumstance here. But rather, he should treat the race as the opportunity to acquaint more and more people that there is a school of thought here called libertarianism, and that wherever you see somebody upholding the libertarian banner, that's the banner of smaller government and giving your life back to you. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Chuck. Glad you called. Bye. So, all right. Well, uh, we've gotten a couple of uh, possibilities there with regard to where we might have some hope for the future. I feel that one of the most important things we can do is to keep spreading the message because it isn't just the sheer numbers of people that we are trying to convert to our way of thinking, but it's always the case of you don't know whom it is that is going to hear this message. There's a story that makes the rounds, and I heard it again today from my friend Michael Cloud at the seminar here in Atlanta, uh, which happens to be a seminar on liber libertarian persuasion techniques. But Michael told the story that John Fund has told. John Fund is a uh, senior reporter or editor at the Wall Street Journal. John Fund co-authored Rush Limbaugh's first book, and has been a long-time friend of his. And he says that a lot of people wonder why Rush Limbaugh is antagonistic towards libertarians when he expresses many libertarian ideas and in some ways is more libertarian than a lot of Republicans are. And John says that the first libertarian that Rush Limbaugh ever met was one of these obnoxious know-it-alls who had to tell Rush Limbaugh how wrong he was about certain things that Rush Limbaugh disagreed with the Libertarian about, and that Limbaugh has retained that first impression for years and years of Libertarians being know-it-all, uh, overbearing, obnoxious people. And that's very understandable. That's, happened. that's how prejudices develop in this world. Uh, somebody meets a, a Jew that he doesn't like, and for the rest of his life, he hates all Jews. Somebody else meets uh, somebody from New York, along with a New York accent, comes some kind of fast-talking, sharpy attitude, and for the rest of his life, he's prejudiced against Easterners, and much the same thing can happen. But reverse that. Suppose the first person Rush Limbaugh had ever met had been much more understanding of Limbaugh's position and guided Limbaugh along in a very tolerant way. Uh, Limbaugh might have had an outstanding impression. But there's an even more important reason for talking up these things and talking them up correctly. When you write a letter to the editor or you call into a talk show or you're at a party and you're talking with some people, you never know who's going to hear what you have to say or read what you have written. You never know but what this may be, the next Limbaugh, and you may have touched a nerve in him and touched something that he's already kind of suspected and brought it into focus for him so that now he's much more committed to this kind of a position because he can see it thanks to what you said. Or you may have reached a person who has the money or the influence or the talent to do many, many things that you can't do or I can't do, and that this person can add so much more to the cause of liberty in America than you or I might be able to do, and you are the one who has turned him in the right direction. You never know. So it means two things, I think. Number one, to continue working without, as I've said so often, without bending your life out of shape, without losing your job over it, but simply wherever you can, make that little difference by, by speaking up. And secondly, learning to do it well. Learning to do it in a non-confrontational way so that you are not a winner and a loser in an argument, but rather somebody who's just seeking the truth like the person you're talking to, and you've discovered some things that maybe this person might be interested in knowing about too. We can come back to that as we go along during the rest of the broadcast. But first, let's get to Gordon in Pennsylvania and see what's on his mind. Good evening, Gordon. Hi, Harry. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. I share your despair about the, the, uh, the press. Um, but, you know, there are some very articulate people. I'm thinking specifically of George Will and a few others, uh, not, not the uh, network anchors, uh, who are very intelligent and articulate people, and people listen to them and, 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 uh, and are, are guided by them. I know that he can see the principles of libertarianism, but you very, hear, very rarely hear him espouse it on the air, um, except in very general terms. And I, I, I worry about this a lot, because I know that there are a lot of people, extremely intelligent people, in positions of power, I think specifically now Alan Greenspan, who at one time sat at the knee of one of the most prominent free market thinkers of all time, Ayn Rand, and yet now he's he's a part of this. He's a part of the the government governmental mm -hmm. system to to control the money supply, to fund these welfare programs and and the military programs and all the things the government's involved in. He knows better. I know he knows better. Uh, why on earth is it that that these intelligent bright people can can who can see this have seemed to have gone on to the other side? Gordon, who's on the phone with us now from Pennsylvania, raised the question: What about somebody like uh, Alan Greenspan, who? for many years was a teacher of free market economics and then lo and behold one day woke up as the chairman of the Federal Reserve System right in the belly of the beast and far from doing anything to make it more of a free market he's just there furthering the, the very thing that is a problem which is government producing fiat money and contributing to inflation in this country. Gordon, you're still with us, aren't you? Yes, I am, Harry. Uh, I think what, uh, two, two comments that occur to me. One is that it points out the fact that power does corrupt and it also, it isn't just that power corrupts people after they get there, but that power 
by its very nature, attracts the wrong kinds of people, people who can see this as an opportunity to do something. Now, whether that's true in uh, Greenspan's case, I can't really say. But the point is that it's the power itself that is the problem rather than the abuse of power. And the second thing that I want to mention is that you're going to win some and lose some. All right, so Alan Greenspan got into a position of power and is misusing it. But look at the other side of the coin. Last night we arrived here in Atlanta. I turned on the television set, and lo and behold, there was John Stossel doing one of his one-hour broadcasts, and I believe it was called Lies, Myth, and Downright Stupidity. And he was talking about, I guess it, I got in the middle of it, so I think it was something like the ten biggest myths right now. And they were things like Republicans want to shrink government was one of the myths. Another one was that the environment is getting pollu more polluted all the time. And uh, he did an excellent job on it. He, there was nothing that I saw in the broadcast that I would disagree with. There might have been some things where I would have gone a little further or added something that he didn't say, but those are mere quibbles. So while Greenspan is off in Washington doing a mischief, uh, there's John Stossel on ABC television doing very, very good work. So you, you just have to figure that some of them will work out and some of them won't. And I'm not sure I'm really addressing your question, am I? Well, to some extent you are. I think the problem with libertarians is that many people view us as a group of crackpots, and, uh, and I think that there are a lot of independent thinkers, and so, uh, that, and so there doesn't seem to be any unanimity. The only one I've ever talked to or, heard or read of who has it all together and complete package is you, and um, now I'm thinking of uh, Neil Borch, who has a, uh, a radio talk show, and I, I like him. I mean, I think he's good, but, but he, he supports the, the Civil War that we're, that we're uh, in, in Iraq as if we could do anything uh, there until there's economic stability over there. I mean, it's just, it's just nonsense. And, and I think that libertarianism is probably split on this very issue, um, which, in, which if you say that the government has the right to wage war, it's really an anti-libertarian in principle. I have to think everyone's a libertarian. The rest of them just haven't, haven't thought it through, uh, mostly because their own office hasn't been gored yet. But um, I think maybe this is why libertarianism has, has some difficulty being well, the 9-11 attack was a terrific blow yeah. to the libertarian movement because before that, I would guess, and this is just purely a guess, that 90% of the people who call themselves libertarians would have espoused a non-interventionist foreign policy. But the enormous social pressure that was brought about by the 9-11 attack, the pressure to go along and be patriotic and be American, I think was too much for some libertarians who hadn't had a chance yet to really think it through and to feel very strongly about those non-intervention principles. Yeah, and, I, do, I do understand that. And I think that that can be true for a public figure just as much as it is for the average individual. Uh, one thing that we all need to keep reminding ourselves of, I believe, is that the desire to be free is a basic human instinct. It is not an acquired trait. It is not uh, something that you have to be educated to. Everybody wants to live his own life the way he wants to live it. Now, he may not want others to be able to do that, but you have to remember that everybody is on your side to begin with, at least to the extent that he does want to live his own life. He does want to keep all the money that he earns. He does want to be able to raise his children by his values. And we don't have to to educate people to the joys and benefits of being able to do that. We just need to show them that, number one, it's not a pipe dream to think that you ought to be able to do that. And number two, you don't have to be afraid when other people are going to have that kind of freedom, too. And all that may not be as easily uh, done as said, but the point is that we should never forget that everybody, really, almost everybody, is on our side right to begin with. The desire to be free is just as much a part of being a human being as the desire to survive and the desire to procreate. People want to live in spite of all the difficulties that they face sometimes. People want to procreate, which is what we think of as a sex urge, and people want to be able to make their own decisions, even if part of those decisions is to whom they're going to delegate it. We don't need to feel that we are the crackpots. We are the people who identify with well, I, the I very basic human instinct. Yeah, I know. I just wish more other, uh, that others would feel the same way. Yeah. Well, Gordon, stay with us. I'm so glad you uh, you checked in, and I appreciate your thoughts. Let us know anytime you've got something on your mind. Thanks so much, Harry. You bet. Let's talk now with Gary in South Carolina. Gary, are you there with us, Hello? Uh Yes. How are you, sir? Just fine. Thanks for staying on the line. Uh, to give you a little background, I uh, learned in 1979 that most of what the government was doing was unconstitutional, mm -hmm. and I founded a group called Citizens for Constitutional Government, and I, I'm now a candidate for Congress. And uh, the biggest problem I'm having, uh, I've already run three or four times, and, and I have been identified as a libertarian. Uh, I run that's on, the problem? <laughs> well, I run, I run on the Republican Party ticket because I have talked with Ron Paul. I talked with Delmar Dennis, who ran for president on the American Party ticket twice. And uh, Delmar Dennis even tried to form a, a, a third party uh, in addition to that. And, and I've talked to a number of other people that have uh, been trying to get limited government back and, and my problem uh, right now, we've got uh, Christian uh, groups and organizations that are uh, bashing Bush, encouraging people to vote for anybody other than Bush, 
and we've got uh, uh, Christian groups that are encouraging people not to vote at all. And uh, uh, I'm just having a whole lot of problems with uh, third-party movements and other movements that are, are, uh, are doing things that are preventing me from getting elected. This is intriguing because I haven't heard of any Christian groups that are talking up anybody but Bush. Well, we've got one. We've got one in South Carolina, and they just uh, uh, founded a, a website, and and they are saying their uh, mantra is, "The lesser of two evils is still evil." Well, do you disagree so, with that? I, I certainly do. If the result uh, is more evil, in other and, words, if a not vote or a, a, a vote for opposition uh, to that per, uh, that party dumps that person and gives you somebody worse. All right. Who, who, for instance, would be worse than Bush? Anybody. Anybody, because what you're doing is you're taking power away from Ron Paul, for example. Ron Paul is the closest, uh, to my view, in Congress now. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Tan Credo, for example. And all of those folks that are in the, the Liberty Committee, there's about 22 of them that have pledged to try to uh, follow the Constitution. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the group that I would be in. But uh, the way you get power is you go in. I think the best thing to do would have all of these uh, uh, third-party groups sponsor somebody in one of the major parties. And Are you talking about sponsor a presidential candidate? No, no. You can't do anything with the president. Uh, but you can put the right people in Congress, and if you have the right people in Congress, it doesn't matter who the president is. Well, to a point that's true, but the president has the veto, and the president has a lot of power to do things uh, without acts of Congress unless you've got a very, very strong and principled Congress. I guess we're going to just disagree about the anybody but Bush thing. Well, yeah, that's, but that's, that's not really that important. But I am intrigued to know what is it that this Christian group there objects to in Bush? Oh, well, uh, there's a lot of things that I object to in Bush. Okay, but what specifically has caused an organized Christian group to say anybody but Bush? Well, they... Uh, 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 he appointed three homosexuals to cabinet positions or, or some kind of positions. Uh, the immigration thing, the big spending policies, uh, the, uh, the increase in health care, and things like that. But when a president makes a recommendation, that doesn't make it law. And the president is not a legislator. And what we need is we need the right people in Congress. If we had two-thirds uh, uh, in the House uh, where all bills to raise revenue must originate, that's where the power really is. And uh, in Congress... Uh, created the Supreme Court, and uh, Congress can uh, impeach the Supreme Court when they make these crazy decisions, and uh, Congress can limit the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. And, and Congress is where the power is constitutionally uh, vested, and that's where we need to concentrate. And when we've got, uh, uh, if I file to run for office this year, it's going to cost me three uh, three thousand one hundred and forty dollars to file to run as a Republican. Uh, anybody in the Constitution Party or the Libertarian Party can run for zero dollars, and they will get three percent of the vote. And so that 6% of the vote is gone that I could use because I, I need about 15%. And it seems to me like since people identify me as being a libertarian or a constitutionalist, it seems to me like these folks would not run against me if what they are really interested in is getting better government. It seems to me like they would uh, stop running against me. I understand. Do you identify yourself as a libertarian? No, I, I identify myself as a strict constitutionalist. Okay, well, you heard me say earlier, maybe, well, maybe you tuned in later, that I think it's very important right now for libertarians to be running to promote the libertarian label. And if you're not going to run as a libertarian, and somebody is running as a libertarian and pointing out that the word libertarian means smaller government, freedom, strict adherence to the Constitution, and helps to pave the way for the next libertarian that runs, and the libertarian that runs for this office over there and that one over there, then I'm definitely going to support that libertarian who's promoting the libertarian label over anyone else who is just running as an independent or a Republican or anything else, because I believe that neither one of them is going to be successful in the short term, and I'm looking for what can help make things better in the long term. Uh -huh. And so I think you're going to find that a lot of libertarians there in South Carolina are going to feel the same way. But, Gary, we're all working uh, in the same direction, and I'm certainly not going to stick my foot out and trip you. So I wish you well, and let us know how it's going for you this year. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Let's talk with Rod in Tennessee. Good evening, Rod. You with us? Good evening, Harry. Uh, it's wonderful to talk to the, the man who, from whom which I cast my proudest vote ever. Well, thank you. Uh, how, uh, by the way, how's the book coming along? <laughs> oh, you would have to ask, wouldn't you? <laughs> I buttered you up, and then I threw you to the wolves. Right. Well, it's, it's, it's a long haul, but I am still assuming that the book is going to be published this fall. Uh -huh. Whether it will be before, before or after the election, I don't know. And for those who haven't heard me weeping and wailing about this over the weeks, the book is The War Racket, a compendium of lies that have lured Americans into wars. It's not just lies. It's lies, promises, myths, and propaganda that have lured Americans into war after war. And I hope to have it finished in the next few months, and the publishers still on schedule to try to get it out in the fall, and uh, we'll hope for the best. It may take six months to publish the subtitle alone. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I look forward to it here. Uh, you, uh, you mentioned my... Uh, uh, 
my crazy Tennessee law. Oh my goodness gracious! You know. Yeah, I, I, I testified before the uh, the House Election Subcommittee here twice on that crazy thing, and the first time they uh, uh, they gave us sort of a trial run uh, to see if it would work, so to speak, you know, uh, this kind of thing. And of course, it did work really well. And then of course, that's that's the reason they had to get rid of it. Well, wait, wait uh, just a second. I'm I'm sorry, I wasn't aware of that. You mean for a, a brief period of time, yeah. it actually was possible to put the libertarian label yeah. on the ballot? Between, uh, in the, I believe it's the 2000 election. Uh, it was possible we worked to uh, uh, get a, a bill passed in the state legislature, uh, which passed uh, unanimously, believe it or not, um, in the state legislature there that uh, changed the label where the, the libertarians could put a uh, libertarian label if they if they designated uh, wanted to by their county election commission, whatever. I see, and, and it and it worked uh, fabulously well, and that's of course why the legislature wouldn't let us do it again. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, as a concerned citizen of uh, Tennessee, I have to deplete ignorance and uh, embarrassment that I didn't know. And before we go to the break, stay with us, Rod. But let me just say to, to anybody else. This is an example of what libertarians are up against. And so when somebody says you guys aren't getting anywhere, you have to realize that a lot of it is that it's because of the laws that have been imposed at the state level. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes. This is Harry Brown. Hello again. Harry Brown here, and we're talking with Rod in Tennessee. And we're talking about the fact that in Tennessee it is against the law, <laughs> it really is against the law, to list your party label on the ballot unless you're a Republican or a Democrat. In other words, if you're a Libertarian, a Green, or a Prohibitionist, Vegetarian, whatever, you have to list your name and then the word Independent by it. So promoting the libertarian label doesn't do any good in Tennessee because nobody's going to know which ones are the libertarians. And, of course, they usually justify this by saying, well, you know, people need to be protected. But the fact of the matter is that this is not protection for anybody but the Republicans and Democrats because if you're inclined not to vote Republican or Democrat, you're scared to death to vote for an independent because you don't know but what you may be voting for a communist or a neo-Nazi or somebody else because there's no label by his name and he could be anything. So obviously this is nothing more than a ploy to protect the Democrats and Republicans and keep their duopoly, as they call it. And various other states have various other laws to try to make it as difficult as possible for any third party to break into the, the game. Rod, uh, uh, yeah, Yes, sir, I, I would only add uh, one little thing to that, and that is... Uh, of course, in the state of Tennessee, with our madcap crazy legislature, you'll never know who voted for something or against something because they never record their votes. Oh, is it always a <laughs> voice vote or something? Huh? Is it always a voice vote? It, it, is, it is always a voice vote unless it's on the uh, floor of the state legislature, an uh, actual bill. They don't uh, record uh, any kind of vote, so you never know. Um, you, you had a, a great point earlier, and you've had various examples of this on your show tonight, uh, of why to be optimistic, a, a great question. Um, I was a great friend of, of the late, I know you know him, the late Dr. Richard Pearl Sr. Mm -hmm. And one of the things he used to do is he used to go into high school government classes and give little lectures along with Republicans and Democratic uh, uh, people who would uh, – be invited up uh, by that teacher or something, and he used to get rave reviews of, of the uh, of little uh, uh, reports that he would that the uh, students would have to write after they all these speakers had come uh, come by and how amazed they were. They never heard this before, et cetera, et cetera. And he did this for months, um, and it was it was really spectacular. Uh, but the one thing that he realized that I think a lot of people miss is there are a great deal of things that the average person can't do to change things that are going on in Washington D.C. But what you can do, in the words of Booker T. Washington, is simply cast down your bucket right where it is. You can change a great deal of things in your own backyard. Uh, he helped stop a, a $13 million uh, uh, commerce center that was uh, uh, pushed by the uh, government uh, here in Murfreesboro uh, that was going to be tax-funded. Uh, uh, stopped that. We stopped a, uh, a cheerleading uh, uh, former Don, Don Sunquist who was uh, pushing a, a state income tax for three years. Uh, things like that. There's a great deal that you can do right there in your own backyard to uh, not uh, so much uh, – uh, bring back liberty, but at least stop it from being uh, eroded any further. Uh, so I think uh, there are num numerous examples of, of how you can do that. Just yes, and I think, it's a, I think it's important always to try to broaden the issue that when you are fighting a state income tax or anything of this sort, any new bill, to make the issue broader than just this item. But this is just one more example yes, that yes. we cannot give politicians power because this is what they will do with it. So you give them an inch and they will run a mile. And what we really need to do is not be adding a new tax, but be getting rid of all these taxes that are there now. Use the issue at hand as an example of something broader so that you are not always fighting a rear guard action, so that you are not fighting these things one at a time, but each time that you are taking one on, you're fighting something more than just this particular issue. And you are taking advantage of the fact that this issue is in the news and people are willing to listen to you, whether it's in a letter to the editor or a call to talk radio or whatever it may be, and it may be a, an issue for a, a new stadium, government-funded, or it may be an issue for a new regulation or whatever it is, but use it as an opportunity to show that this is why we've got to, to cut government down to size. Yeah, uh, yeah, I agree. And, and the, the last point is the one thing, I, when I walk around with him and going to these uh, meetings with these uh, uh, legislators and, and uh, uh, 
the local government stuff, meetings and things, boards and things like that, is the thing that you will realize when you're just a little local activist, you know, is that, generally speaking, libertarians have been doing this kind of thing for years. And when, when faced with opposition like that, a lot of times, Democratic and Republican uh, government people just don't know what to do. Uh, <laughs> they're just at a loss of how to approach this, because uh, a lot of times we would, uh, uh, they would just simply give up and go away, uh, as amazing as that may seem. And, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understand you. Are you saying that if they're intimidating, then the protesters go away, or are you saying that when somebody protests, they give up? Well, uh, in, in, the, in the terms of the Commerce Center up here, uh, we got enough votes to put it on the public referendum, uh, which they thought was impossible, couldn't be done. I think it was like 2,500 signatures had to be had to be uh, uh, put on petition in like 20 days, something un- unbelievable, and, and we did it here. And when they were faced with the fact that it would come up for a public vote, uh, they commissioned a outside uh, polling firm to uh, to get the vote, get the yes and no's for the for the particular issue, uh, and something like that. We had changed public opinion so much in the, the months leading up to that point uh, that the yes votes for the Commerce Center were somewhere in the single digits, and they just simply scrapped the whole idea. Really? Well, yeah. That's nice. yeah, it was amazing how it, how it turned out, but uh, they just didn't know what to do, um, so they just gave up. <laughs> so sometimes you can win every once in a while, uh, but uh, it's, it's, it's pretty, especially in like the local communities, and not so much the legislatures, but the local communities, have, you have a great deal of influence, because you don't realize that a lot of people just simply don't show up to these meetings. Mm-hmm. Uh, they just do what they want to, you know, put some yard signs out, get elected, and just go on about their business, you know. Right, I see what you're saying. Any yeah. show of opposition, opposition is going to bring them up short, because oh, yeah. it's, it's so unexpected. Yeah. That's terrific. Well, sure. thanks so much for the insights, Rod. I no appreciate problem. it. Thanks a lot, Harry. Good luck to you. And let's now talk with Jonathan in Washington, D.C. Thanks for staying on the line so long, Jonathan. No problem, uh, Harry. One of the things about uh, waiting on hold is that I have to resist the temptation to respond to what other people said while I was waiting on hold and not get to what what I actually wanted to talk about. Well, you usually have something interesting to say, so maybe you can add something to what they said. Well, uh, Or take something away, whatever. First, let me ask you something uh, that I want to know. Have you been – might you speak at the next uh, National Libertarian Party convention? Have you been contacted at all to speak yet? No, I haven't. Oh, okay, so that, right now that's not... Uh, not uh, doesn't seem to be in the cards, no. Okay, um, well, then I will get to what I, I wanted to, uh, to say. I think uh, it's a great question that you asked uh, about whether to be optimistic right now. And I have to say that um, I am not terribly optimistic. Uh, and actually, I've read a lot of what, what you've written since you've been involved in the Libertarian Party, and, and I've listened to a lot of your speeches uh, that you've given. And I have to say that early on, it, when you uh, first began your, uh, to run for president, I thought that you were exhibited a an optimism that was way beyond reasonable. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't like to uh, to criticize you, but uh, I, I think that um, I heard you say things like libertarians are the mainstream now, and as though everyone in America already agreed with us, and we just had to put our ideas out to enough people, and we would be able to change the entire system. And I have to tell you, I've heard you say uh, lately as well that, you know, polls, many public opinion polls show that m- uh, a majority of Americans think that government is way too big. And that may be true. But I have to I point out that just because people say that government is way too big in some vague, undefined way, that doesn't necessarily mean that they agree with with distinctly libertarian uh, ideas. I'm not saying they're not, they wouldn't be receptive to them, but that doesn't mean that if you pose a question like, do you, okay, you believe government's way too big. Do you believe that all drugs should be legalized? Do you believe that Social Security should be completely privatized? Do you believe that we should get rid of 90% of the federal agencies that exist today? Uh, go back that we'd to get a positive result. No, of course not, or else we would be getting it. Uh, there's no question about that, but that's where, uh, that's where the work comes in. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly, but I just think that if, I, I think that we have to recognize that, and I don't know Maybe you deal with a lot more libertarians than I do, but I talk to a lot of people where these libertarian ideas still need to be still need to be sold. Uh, they're not they're not just tacitly accepted, and, and in many cases they're viewed as wildly out of the the mainstream. Um, even if these people agree that yeah, well, in general I don't like politicians, I don't like this or that. Um, so I, I am not terribly optimistic, um, and I, I'm even less optimistic when I, I deal with libertarians, people who self-identify themselves as libertarians, and yet for some reason or other, they won't support the Libertarian Party. Um, in my opinion, that unless we have people in political office that are themselves committed in principle to, to liberty and value uh, freedom over their own, their own power, uh, we're not going to get what we want. We need a significant number of people in office like that. We don't have that now, and that's why I think the Libertarian Party needs to exist. But it, so it discourages me greatly when I hear people who already are on our side either, you know, write the party off as a waste of time or something or other to that effect. And there are many libertarians uh, being in Washington, D.C., uh, uh, and dealing with a lot of libertarian organizations with libertarians in it, I, I know, who feel that way. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I really don't 
understand what their antipathy is toward the party. Um, but it, it really is, I, I mean, that makes it even more difficult, in my opinion, when people who are already ostensibly on our side um, aren't joining up with, with an effort to make it a, a, have a direct difference and are uh, all too often, will, the most intellectually honest ones don't, but a lot of them are willing to make excuses for Republicans and or Democrats, people who are already in power, uh, that is, uh, is just well beyond uh, well beyond the level that excuse making level that anyone should be. Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. I can understand how they arrive at that point, and it is a slippery slope. You start making those excuses, and then the next thing you know, you are finding yourself betraying your own principles and even saying things that are just almost the opposite of what you believe. The founding fathers warned against the idea of political parties because political parties preceded the American Revolution, not necessarily in America, but in the English Parliament and so on. They had the Whigs and the Tories, and the founding fathers were most of them were opposed to the idea of political parties. And I'd heard that for many, many years, but I never really thought about it. And I don't know anything more about it factually now, but I can suddenly see one of the reasons, and that is that people become wedded to the party instead of the principles. And they may start out thinking that the party is the vehicle to the principles, but the next thing you know, the party becomes an end in itself. Well, hello again, and this is our last segment, so let me begin by thanking Aaron Armstrong for keeping everything together tonight, especially under more difficult circumstances with me in Atlanta instead of in my studio at home. And I want to thank you not just for tuning in, but tolerating the poorer sound quality because I'm on a regular telephone line, and I really do appreciate your tuning in on Saturday nights, and I hope you continue to do so. We're talking with Jonathan in Washington, D.C. about the prospects for liberty in America, and was there anything further you wanted to add, Jonathan? Well, I just want to say that even though I'm, I'm not optimistic, I don't think it's impossible. I think it can happen, and I think that, uh, um, you know, uh, it, it, it's, even though there are a lot of obstacles in the way, we have to keep our destination in mind. And every time I hear someone say something about, uh, talk about the president, a libertarian-minded individual talk about the presidential election um, and whether they should support uh, George Bush or support whoever the Democratic nominee is, I say, you know, a lot, I know a lot of libertarians who voted for George W. in 2000 because he, they thought that he seemed somewhat quasi-libertarian, and now they regret it deeply. And I voted for Harry Brown, and I never regretted it once. So, and I just leave them with that. So that's basically all I have to say. Well, thank you very much, Jonathan. I appreciate it as always. And uh, let's see if we can just squeeze in one more phone call quickly. Eric, I'm sorry we're right up against it, but is there something you can say in a minute or so? Hello? Eric, yes. Yes, sir. Um, I'm 17 years old, and I think you need to get your libertarian message out to all of America's youth, because I heard your show on October 25th, and I mean, I can promise you when I turn 18, I'll be a libertarian registered. Oh, that's wonderful. I appreciate it. What did you say a moment ago? You said you heard the show when? October 25th. And... Oh, actually, that was the first time you'd heard it? Yes, sir. Oh, good. Well, I hope you stay with it I week after will. week. Thanks so much for checking in, Eric, on, and uh, let us hear from you any time. All right. Well, thank you again for tuning in tonight. Let's see if we can sum this up. As I said an hour or so ago, I am hopeful, but I'm not optimistic. I can see how this can be turned around. If we just keep spreading the message, it's going to register with some people who can do things that we can't do. And even if we never do, there is an advantage to continuing to carry this message. All of the important people, or let us let me say 90% of all the important people that have passed through my life and have made my life so much better have been libertarians. And I feel that every single person, that becomes a libertarian and takes responsibility for his own life and realizes that persuasion is the way to get things done rather than through the force of government, that I have helped to create somebody who can be a new friend, somebody who can be a new business associate, somebody that who can help me in my personal life to get things done. My book agent, my newsletter editors, my newsletter publishers, my wife, all the important people in my life have been libertarians and it has made my life so easy on a personal level. And uh, the more people that become libertarians and take responsibility for their own lives, the better relationships that we can have in the world. So I don't regret a single moment that I have spent uh, talking about these things, promoting these ideas, and so on, because I've seen the benefit of them. And I do feel that most people in America are basically libertarian. But that doesn't mean that they understand this. That doesn't mean that they agree with us on all the issues. That doesn't mean that they've ever thought about any of these issues. But that's our job. That's what we're here for, is to acquaint them with it. And we have to learn to do it in a non-confrontational way, to show them that we want the same things that they do. We want security for their children. We want security for the country. We want them to be able to raise their children by their values, and not by the values of Teddy Kennedy, Bill Clinton, George Bush, Newt Gingrich, and Trent Lott, and the whole gang in Washington, and that we want them to be able to have the fruits of their own labor. And if we do this and do not approach them as people to be conquered, as arguments to be won, ignorance to be dispelled, but rather as friends to be helped and guided along, then we do have a chance. It's a long shot. There's no question about it. But have a good time while you're doing it, and don't bend your life out of shape. And enjoy yourself this week, and tune in again next Saturday night, please. Talk to you then. This is Harry Brown. Good night.